Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Boyan. Um, so the mic is all right, yes? Okay. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, running an event sourcing system in production. Um, I've been working uh, in Python for about five years now, I guess, uh, in software for uh, 15 years or so. We were using event sourcing system at my previous job for a few years, and I'm trying to uh, compile some experiences and um, and hopefully some tips uh, for you today. So in a nutshell, once I'm done talking here, I would like you to keep a positive idea about event sourcing. Uh, maybe think about it and consider it for your next project or your next big refactor. So I will talk about some roadblocks and patterns we, we use to solve them, um, common things that I think you will encounter when you start in event sourcing. Uh, we have a very nice library in Python to, to handle event sourcing, which is called event sourcing. Uh, look it up on PyPI. It's, uh, it's, it's flexible and it provides a lot of really solid uh, building blocks. So I'm going to use the library today in my code examples to illustrate a bit what I'm talking about. It's not going to be a tutorial, so I'm going to make some simplification on uh, the library API itself. And I'm also, hopefully not too much, but maybe muddy a bit the water with uh, definitions and concepts. I'm trying to be a bit more pragmatic and I don't have too much time. So the event sourcing and, uh, and related concepts I'm going to quickly touch on um, together with, uh, with code examples to, to show you a bit what it can look like in Python. After that, I will talk about evolution uh, of a projection, domain, and runtime, and these names and concepts will also be explained along the way. So first of all, my example today um, is not going to be um, a cargo shipping or bank transactions or shopping cart, which is usually what you see with domain-driven design and event sourcing. I'm using something a bit more simple, something a bit more simple. It's still a contrived example because, well, we don't have uh, too much time today. Uh, imagine, uh, imagine you want to meet with your friends um, and you would just developed basically a gathering service, um, so just for your group of, of non-people. So the service is quite simple. You don't have a lot of concurrent users. And that also means that um, the, your, your domain, the way while where you are working, you don't have to handle too many concepts. And I will uh, show you a bit later what I mean by that. So it's in the title, What's Up With Event Sourcing? Um, simply put, it's about capturing the state changes into a sequence of events, rather than just persisting the current state. Um, these events are the one and only source of truth. Everything else is derived from them. So in comparison, uh, traditional um, approach persists the current states, which gets overwritten when you make a change to it. In comparison, event sourcing um, offers a complete history of all the changes, and you can, you will build the state from it. If it's a bit confusing now, hopefully with the examples you will uh, see what I mean. Um, we have been doing this kind of things for about 5,000 years already. Um, uh, we found some clay tablets in, uh, from Mesopotamia from 3000 BC, and basically they were already keeping ledgers of market transactions. And a ledger um, is basically a recording of transactions, so those are the facts that happen. It's not the, the tally, right? It's not who owes uh, what right now, what's the total. That's a projection. You use all the transactions, all the events, to eventually count where you stand in your, uh, in your tally between basically two sellers or a seller and a buyer on your market. Greg Young, who I'm, whom I quoted here, um, is, is well, well known advocate, advocate of event sourcing and domain driven design. And I think nowadays most people using event sourcing really um, blend the two together, at least the technical aspects of it, which is what I'm also doing today. So, Domain-driven design, what is it? Um, it's a bit more recent, so only about 20 years old now. Uh, it, was, it was first de described by Eric Evans. And it's, 
it, it's basically, um, it's about sharing knowledge, having a common understanding between the operators, so the, the users, the practitioners of your domain, and the modelers, so us the developers, the technical folks. Um, it's a methodology, it's a, it is patterns, it is many things, uh, but here, in a nutshell, the technical aspects of it, you, um, you have basically the, the domain, which is um, a, a bubble, the specific env environment the business operates in, and today I'm going to equate a domain to a namespace, so a, a module in Python. And then you have aggregates, which, um, which are the smallest addressable units in your system. They enforce a, a boundary. So nobody can ever reach within an aggregate to state the change. Everybody has to go through the aggregate, which means that the aggregate um, is used to maintain the invariance. Um, so any, any constraints is being enforced by the aggregate. And aggregates, it's quite important, are not about relationships. They're not about hierarchy. So don't think about it as a class diagram of your system. It's more about the cases that exist in the domain and how best to support those the rules, right? Uh, all the exceptions and all the conditions. You know the business rules. From there, you can create the aggregate and, uh, and the structure is just enough to support that. You don't need to go overboard. So what do we get when we mix event sourcing and domain driven design? Um, I'm going to quickly show you with the example of the event sourcing library. Um, so that's just a high level view of uh, core domain classes, core domain, core domain classes, the aggregate and the domain events. Um, and on the, on the left, those two classes are basically meant to be derived. Those are just parent classes, right, with metadata. And on the right, you can see how I'm using it. So what can happen to a meeting, basically? What are the facts that we want to record? What are the events? And so a meeting can be created by somebody about a topic. It has a schedule. It can be edited. It can be rescheduled, uh, canceled, and so on and so forth. So how, do we want, how can we use these events now, briefly, also still uh, to illustrate the point? So there are a few ways to weave the logic and the event together, and here I went for a two-way binding with the event decorator over the dunder init method. And this basically makes it so that when we instantiate uh, a meeting aggregate, a new event, created in this case, is created and queued for us. Right? It's quality of life decorator, basically. We can do it with, from first principles, but this is just a commodity offered by the library. And, um, and from the other side, when we have, the, when we have like a sequence of events and we want to reconstruct the upgrade straight state from them, this, this binding also makes it so then that when we see the meeting the created event, the dunder init method is called for us with the same attributes. So the attribute of the event matches the attribute from the dunder init method here. Something else that we can see is the divergence here between the attributes from the aggregate itself and the attributes that we have on the events. Um, so if you don't really see it, I'm going to tell you. Um, so we, we have, for instance, the edited or canceled events have a re an additional reason attribute, right? Which makes sense when you think about the facts that happened to the meeting, but edited or canceled, and if you want to notify your participants, you will want to know why. But for this, the purpose of this aggregate, I am not storing reason or the actual meeting author or meeting owner even. Because this aggregate, the, the method it has to edit or to cancel, they are about the invariance. They are about enforcing that the topic is not empty. Right? It's not about who created it. I have no invariance on, in this one in this case. So I don't need to care about it at the aggregate level. But I do want to care about it in general. Um, 
but it's not it's not here but I'm going to care about it I will explain a bit uh, further where <clears throat> the point is that I'm separating the commands and the queries and this is um, the command query responsibility segregation pattern is basically about keeping the comments and the queries separated, as the name implies, and the data structures that they use. So the idea is when you want to make a change, you are focused, targeted. You don't need to know about the whole world, right? You just have a very simple uh, structure to initiate your comment. And on the other side, when you query your system, you will likely want to have more information available. You want a broader view. So, uh, hence the difference between the write models and the read models. And since, since the aggregate is this structure to enforce our invariance, it's basically our write models. And I'm keeping the read models aside, but we can also have them in the aggregate. But I will show you an example, which uh, I've been using in production. It's basically having read models um, uh, projected to, to a Django model. First off, um, a quick look at how we, um, a bit of, of infrastructure with the, with the event sourcing library before looking at how we can get the read models. Um, so the application is the programmatic entry point to a domain. It basically holds the public comments <coughs> in the domain and it provides a means to persist the aggregate events. Um, yeah, and we can basically persist uh, one or more aggregates at once atomically. That's the, that's the point of application. It, it is the unit of work. Um, a process application is, is it just another application but that knows how to react to other domain events. So typically, uh, this is where you will um, have local caches about aggregates from other domains or that you will trigger more commands based on a fact that happened prior. Well, briefly, the, the system is just the way to, um, to detail the graph, so which application is subscribed to which of application, so when that we know where to send the domain events, basically. And the runner is uh, simply the executor which pushes events around in the system. So an example of an application uh, here with, with the meetings, um, basically, okay, I guess I will go quickly about it. Um, <coughs> uh, you can see that so the, in the create method, we are basically creating a new meeting aggregate. And as I explained earlier, we have a binding, so this also queues up an event for us. So when we save the meeting in the application, then what happens behind the scene is the application uh, collects all the pending events from the aggregate and saves them. Because what we want to keep is the events in the end, not the aggregate per se which is illustrated in the second method, edit, where we look for the aggregate and, and then we can actually execute a command on it. And here, uh, the self-repository get meeting ID is basically hydrating the aggregate from the events that are stored, um, well, a new event store. So they are applied in sequence and the state of the aggregate is rebuilt that way. So this is, this is kind of glue code, basically, um, to, um, to, to, yeah, to not expose the, the persistence mechanism to the outside world. And I have, I have other examples in my extras, I'm not going to show that in the main run of the talk, but the idea of save is to be atomic. So we could potentially save multiple aggregates together or fail together. So the other methods are left here um, as, as uh, stubs. So we could also add a new method here to basically run a query and rebuild the aggregate and then expose some fields we want from it. But as I said, um, I prefer to 
have a dedicated structure for that. And I will actually show you here an example of two of the structures. So a pretty much one-to-one -one structure would be the meeting info. It's very close to the aggregate in terms of structure. Um, we know about the offer of the meeting, we know about the topic, about the skill of the participants. So basically, this is the kind of structure you, you want to use when you list the meetings that are coming up. Right? If you expose that to, in, to, your, to your web application, that's your list operation. And another kind of read model or projection we can, we can make from the same events is, uh, is statistics. Right, this is a very common approach, like report statistics. Uh, the same data is basically viewed from a different perspective. And, and here it's, I don't know if you were early, here earlier for the aggregate um, Django view models, uh, but that's that. It's basically an aggregation of the different meetings. Um, and here I'm just um, some simple stats with a number of meetings and number of participants. So that's just to give you an idea that the, how I view my data, I keep it separated. This is the read model, it's not the right model. I don't need to know about the statistics to schedule a new meeting, basically. All right, so let's go a bit further. And uh, now we are done with the concepts and the illustration. Um, let's go into use case territory a bit more. So I will begin with the projections. And first off, the simplest case, just when we need a new projection, and then a quick look at handling a projection that needs to change. So say that you have a domain which events you're interested in. Hint, hint, I am interested in the meetings events. So I will write a projection for that. Um, you can also have multiple domains you're interested in. That's also a strength of projection. It doesn't have to map to your um, aggregates. So we will basically um, subscribe to the domain events with a process application. And in the, in the callback, in the policy method, we will then have logic based on the type of the event that we see. And I would suggest to when you are going to production to basically fail loudly if you encounter an event you don't know about. Right? Don't be lenient. Don't have a default case in your, in your match statement. Uh, the idea is, I think it's better to fail and then fix than to silently swallow or ignore the, um, the unknown event because you, then you will get to a broken state, basically in your projection. And you might not notice it. Obviously that's, uh, um, you want a, a good test coverage to catch this before going to production. It's better than having 500. Um, but the point about the read models is that if you have many queries, so queries in the general sense here, um, and they don't really intersect, that's a good use case for having different read models, right? Um, yeah, just, just like when you have um, it's, it's basically about normalization and denormalization. And you can choose which one makes more sense based on your use case. So a quick example here on how you would do it with, with a Django read model. Um, so you would have a new a dedicated process, process application that is basically uh, subscribed to the meetings, uh, meetings application, which saves the events of a meeting as aggregate. And the idea here is when you, when you uh, well, you, you basically uh, dispatch on the domain event type here. And for instance, for the created event, when you create a new entry in your, in your, uh, in your Django model, um, when you have an edit edited event, when you update this entry based on the identifier, and when you have a canceled event, then you can just delete the entry because this is just a state you can rebuild. It's transient. Um, it doesn't have, you don't have to maintain the history here. It's just really a flat state. Um, and then on the last line, you would basically, that's how you would say that uh, meeting info projector, so this 
projection application subscribe to the meetings application earlier. And you can have many subscriptions in here. So that's the initial implementation of your projection, right? You write that, you run it, um, you're happy to have uh, the, the read models there. And then, and then, <laughs> and then something happens, right? So requirements change, or the read models, um, or the domain events change, and you need to update your read models, or your projection. And once you've done that, you have to replay the whole history to basically catch up your projection with your domain events. So there are two aspects to, to dealing with that. Um, well, <laughs> on the remote side and on the projector side, so on the logic, um, I have to hurry up a bit. So the easiest would be to basically delete all the entries, update your schema, um, and then keep your application offline while you reproject. And that's what I recommend. If you can do that, it's the simplest, just do it. Uh, another, another approach would be to update in place your read models. Uh, but then you have a few more gnarly things, like uh, you need to migrate also your read model schema itself. So you have to handle the conflicts there, because you have existing data you have to migrate. Plus, you will get the new data on top. And if you happen to query this data before the projection has catch up with the domain events, then well, you are in an in-between state. So eventual consistency kicks in, and you basically you are you are lagging behind. Um, another easier model to reason about: create a new projection, a new model, a new table in your database, and and. And I would say switch to that, maybe using more of kind of a blue-green um, uh, blue uh, delivery mechanism. So you switch to the new entries as the old entries um, become obsolete once you are catch up, basically, on the new entries. But this requires a bit more infrastructure um, that is not built in the library. On the logic side, well, again, we have uh, um, the Simplest conceptually, write a new projector, because then you don't have to worry about its own state. Um, it will just basically execute the whole history again, and then you will have your fresh read models. When you have Django, you can pretty easily, I mean, if you're using Django also to maintain the state of your projectors, uh, like you can do with the library, then you can pretty easily reset the state there, and on next startup, your basically projector will replay the history again. That's a nice trick. Um, yeah, so if you can keep your system offline and replay uh, while, while it's there, it's easier, and then you have, it, you have, you have a consistent system on restart. Oops. And yes, all right. OK, so let's shift gears. Um, yeah. So let's talk a bit about the things that can go nasty, like domain evolution. And I want to talk about two things. Uh, domain extensions, so adding a new attribute, and invariance restriction when you want to, for instance, add a unique constraint after the fact. Um, so I'm going to use the example of the meetings and imagine that you are growing the circle of users a bit more, and then now you need to also care about the location, because it's not only one city, it's only one place. There are more people. So um, you have two ways of doing it. You can either upcast existing events with a new attribute or create a new event specifically for this new attribute. In the first case, um, you basically are deriving more information from existing events, which is fine, um, as the new consumers, the new projectors, will basically get the data that has been upcasted. But the projectors that, ha that are already up to date, that have seen the data, won't see it, right? So you are responsible to trigger an update for them. So that's basically fine when you don't have consumers or, if on, or when it's only projectors, but you can just reset and replay. Um, but it's, it shows its limit pretty quickly, uh, semantically speaking, because then there is no trace of what you're doing in the persistence, right? The upcast happens in memory. So if you 
if you basically were to only keep your event, event store, then you wouldn't have this information in there. So just keep it from keep it to metadata and don't use that on core attributes. Um, you could also create a new event. In this case, that's location changed event. Um, and that basically keeps the backwards compatibility and just bridges the gap with existing events. Right? Everybody will get this event as soon as they handle it and stop, stop crashing on it. Um, and the best thing is then your, your event sequence in your event store has the semantics of you can see that the location was changed. It's, it's in there and you're describing basically what happened in your history more concretely. Um, so in, in this example of location, uh, it makes more sense because it's a really a core attribute to our domain. So that's what we want to do. Um, but of course, we, when we start, no aggregate have this information, right? It's, uh, it's undefined for all the aggregates. So how do you fill the gaps? Well, you need a kind of a workflow to do this. So either you are able to derive the value from within the aggregate, from the current state, um, or ever you need like an external input, right? You need to basically get the data from the outside world. Um, so quickly, the, the point here is, is that you need to know about your aggregates so that you can loop over them basically either from within the application or from the outside so that you can then ask them to derive the location. Right? You, need, um, you need to hook in basically your control loop. Um, so in this case, that's, uh, yeah, well, the, the example is you just ask for a specific meeting to get this location. Um, just quickly passing over this. The other idea would be to then um, have a multi-step approach, so like a long-lived process in which you would basically keep track of all the aggregates and which one are missing the value. And once you are up, uh, up to date with all the aggregates here, you can ask your tracker, okay, so now that you know, uh, please send a notification to all the owners of the meetings that miss the value, right? Um, just be careful because since it is a downstream consumer, you are potentially lagging a bit behind as well, right? Just move it. So the second part of this domain evolution would be um, introducing an, an attribute unicity after the fact. And obviously, if you don't have duplicates, uh, then you don't have problems. You can just introduce a constraint and you're done. If not, then you need to migrate your, your data somehow. And I want to stress out that this is not a technical problem. I've just shown you an example of how to solve uh, this with the medi media for your approach, when you track, track, track each issue and then ask people to solve it for you. It's, it's really, you have to decide from a business perspective, what do you do with duplicates? Um, so mediatorial approach I just shown, um, you could have also, you could merge all the aggregates together, the ones that have the duplicate value, or you could use a temporal approach and basically only keep, for instance, the last one that was updated discarding all the others, right? It's, again, this is really a decision you have to take based on your domain. It's all, all are valid, technically speaking. Um, that's a quick example of the temporal tracker, but it's a bit lengthy on the screen, and I don't have more time, so I'll just skip over it. Again, it's, it's, you keep track of, of things, and you just keep track of the, one that, the last one that was updated, and, uh, and in the end, you can basically uh, have the list of the winning winners. And the final chapter, um, am I done? <laughs> the final chapter is about um, uh, synchronous, synchronous systems, and I will just keep the last, uh, the last um, uh, slide, which summarizes the different approaches. Um, and the winner in this case is once you start to have traffic and you want to handle concurrent um, concurrent requests, go for a hybrid approach, which is uh, basically have more workers, but single-threaded runners. The slides will be available <laughs> online, and I'm, uh, I'm available for more questions. Um, and I guess that's uh, actually 
my end, the end of, of my talk. Thank you.